This week on Low Budget Binge, look out for bugs, demons, lunatics, and dark specters, all driving the cast wild and crazy, descending them into the darkest pits of madness. It's all done for a fraction of the budget of the major leagues, but it still packs quite a wallop. Let's start binging. Welcome back to M.L. Miller Frights. I'm M.L. Miller. Before we begin, please do me a favor and punch that like button down below. Share this video with all of your social media addicted pals. Click subscribe to this channel and ring that bell for notifications. Low Budget Binge is where we venture down the path less traveled and look at low budget, no budget, and sometimes international films that never get that top billing you see with the usual Hollywood fare. I'll indicate in the review down below where you can find these films along with their trailers. Here we go. Blood Conscious is new in select theaters, on demand and digital download from Dark Sky Films. It's directed and written by Timothy Covell. Bethany, played by Deshaun White, her fiancé Tony, played by Lenny Thomas, and her little brother Kevin, played by Augenero Gabaje, go on a trip to visit their parents at a remote cabin on a lake. Once they arrive, they find the house deserted, and an unhinged and unnamed man, played by Stakeland's Nick DiMici, claiming that people are being taken over by demons. Thus begins a descent into madness and paranoia as the three debate about whether the man is delusional, or maybe there really is something paranormal or demonic going on. Blood Conscious is a very low-budget film, reliant on conversation, conflict, and drama to make up for the lack of big effects, sequences, or high production spectacle. While there are guns, knives, and other weaponry brandished that suggest action, there's a whole lot of talking in this film. The three argue in the car about Kevin's lack of motivation. They debate about whether to stay until help arrives or take their chances in the woods. They pontificate about whether or not demons exist, or the people of the lake community may be experiencing some kind of mass contagious shared delusion. Fortunately, the three leads are pretty strong actors, and they make these debates work as they move from cabin to cabin, and go from prisoners to wardens, and finally to reluctant executioners. There's a foreboding sense of untrust throughout Blood Conscious that may not be as powerful as such paranoid classics as Invasion of the Body Snatchers, and more recently, They Look Like People, but they strike some of the same chords. While I commend the filmmakers for really going big with the drama, despite the low budget and low scale of the story, I did feel the film amounted to a big bowl of nothing by the time the credits rolled. The non-ending of Blood Conscious is going to piss off a lot of people, as it is never made clear whether the threat is real or not, and the ending suggests a sequel that seems far more interesting than the movie I watched to lead up to it. It's frustrating because I feel White, Thomas, Gabaje, and especially the always great Nick DiMici really deliver solid performances, but the story just feels flimsy and really feels like lead up to a more promising sequel. I wish there were more meat on the bone with Blood Conscious. It's great that this is a film that stars an African-American cast, and it really does steer clear of making these characters stereotypes you've seen in tons of other horror films. That said, decent acting and a promising premise can't save a movie if the story is as flimsy as this. The Return, aka Homecoming, is new on-demand and digital download from Uncorked Entertainment. It's directed by B.J. Vero and written by B.J. Vero and Ken Jansons. Returning to his childhood home where his sister was murdered in front of him and his mother disappeared, Roger, played by Richard Harmon, has to pack up his home after his father mysteriously dies. With him is his girlfriend Beth, played by Sarah Thompson, and his best friend Jordan, played by Echo Anderson, who plan on helping him through this trying time. When they arrive, Roger's past literally comes back to haunt him as a dark specter begins appearing around his home. Somehow, all of this ties in with his mother's disappearance, his sister's death, his father's suicide, quantum physics, time travel, repressed memories, and hypnosis. The Return is a mixed bag of parts that don't really fit so well together. It's got decent acting from likable characters. Echo Anderson is especially good as Jordan, as is Sarah Thompson as Roger's girlfriend. 
right from the beginning, the complex relationship between Roger, Beth, and Jordan is established in a clear and smart way as Beth rides in the back while Roger and Jordan ride in the front. Yes, this is a simple way to shoot the three main characters in one shot, but it also illustrates where Roger's heart really directs him, despite the fact that he is with Beth. Richard Harmon is actually a strong actor as well. The young actor has been in quite a few horror films like Grave Encounters, Darkness Falls, TV's Bates Motel, and the Van Helsing series, to name a few. While it is great seeing him in a challenging role as the angsty object of two women's desires, I can't help but see him as the Archie Cunningham, Columbine, goth-looking kid. So when he has to look anything but ominous, looking down and up with heavy-lidded eyes, it's harder to buy. Harmon has range, but he just plays the creepy kid really, really well, and it's hard to see him not playing that. The problem with The Return is that it doesn't seem to know what kind of movie it really wants to be. This one feels like a hodgepodge of different parts of other movies loosely stitched together. There's a dark floating ghost haunting the house. There are elements of time travel and quantum physics going on. There's this complex relationship between the three leads. And then there's the whole side quest where Roger has repressed memories that need unburying through hypnosis by his former psychologist. It's too much for one movie. None of these elements are delved into deep enough, except maybe for the love triangle, making the haunting, the time travel, and the hypnosis less effective. It's as if three different people wrote a script and they just glommed all three together with not enough thought. Add in a fairly generic title and some dodgy CG, and you have a film with potential, but ultimately doesn't work. Even with some strong performances and a few decent scares, The Return is a Frankenstein-like movie with parts that just don't seem to quite gel with one another. Behemoth is new in select theaters, on demand and digital download from Level 33 Entertainment. It's directed by Peter Zusik and written by Peter Zusik and Derek Liagas. After finding out his daughter has a terminal illness that may have ties to the chemical corporation he works for, Joshua, played by Josh Eisenberg, becomes a whistleblower for the company and begins to descend into paranoia and madness that there are people out to get him. Out of the desperation, Josh kidnaps the head of the corporation and begins having hallucinations that he's being pursued by not only hitmen, but demons and monsters. Is Josh losing his mind, or is he really being dragged into his own personal hell by infernal forces? Behemoth tells a familiar tale of a world seen through the eyes of an untrustworthy and fragile mind, reminiscent of films like Jacob's Ladder and Carnival of Souls. The demons pursuing Josh may be the representation of his own guilt for working for the polluting corporation, or this might be a literal devil at his heels. Behemoth plays things pretty close to the vest for most of the runtime, trying not to give away what's real and what's simply in Josh's head. At the same time, the movie cuts away from Josh and his predicament to other characters, showing their POVs experiencing strange and otherworldly things. This kind of pops the balloon and gives the answer to the demon's existence early on, so there's a bit of inconsistency here, where the filmmaker wants us to keep guessing, but he's already answered the question. Sure, it could be a case where all of these scenarios are happening in Josh's head, but it seems very unlikely the way the film plays out. All in all, while films like Jacob's Ladder and Carnival of Souls stuck with one person for the entire time, showing the entire world through the soul protagonist's experiences, Behemoth has things happening when Josh isn't around, disconnecting any doubt as to the veracity of what's going on. Storytelling issues aside, Behemoth, for the low budget it is filmed on, has some absolutely fantastic CGI and practical effects. Filmmaker Peter Suzik has worked on CG for quite a few big-budget films and created the effects for Behemoth himself as well as handling the filmmaking chores. As a result, Behemoth is a wonderful sizzle reel of breathtaking effects, from a rampaging demon ram running down the street to a full-body devil prosthetic. This is a film that highlights the effects as only an effects man can. While I think Suzik could have spent a little more time on the story, this is a film that looks top-tier. The director can also film some great sequences incorporating those effects with loads of tension, action, shock, and horror. I had some issues with the acting here, specifically the lead character of Josh, played by Josh Eisenberg. I think the script requires a bit too much from the actor, and there definitely are scenes that Eisenberg isn't able to deliver the level of emotion and mania required to be believable. It's hard to go batshit crazy without it being transparent that the actor is trying too hard. While Eisenberg is fine in the more confident scenes, when emotion is involved, 
it's tougher to digest. Behemoth is an impressive film with high aspirations. While the film doesn't necessarily reach those high goals, what it does deliver is promising. I felt this one was a bit too long, especially with its Twilight Zone-like premise that favors a shorter runtime. Still, seeing what kind of insane imagery and effects are going to show up to top the last proved to never disappoint until the predictable but potent end. The Nest, aka The Bewailing, is new on-demand and digital download from 4Digital Media. It's directed by James Suttles and written by Jennifer Trudrone. After buying a raggedy teddy bear at a garage sale from a creepy old man, young Meg, played by Maple Suttles, begins to form a strong attachment to the bear and then to her worrisome mother Beth, played by Sarah Nevratil. Beth is dealing with her own issues involving a past addiction to pills, and while she's protective of Meg, she realizes Meg's unhealthy attachment issues are not helping anything, especially her troubled marriage with Jack, played by Kevin Patrick Murphy. What Meg's parents don't know is that inside of the teddy bear resides a mind-controlling insect creature who reproduces and possesses the minds of people. It's kind of like Mr. Mind from Shazam. As members of the family become mindless drones, Meg is prepping Beth to be the host for the Hive Queen. I can't help but think that the seeds of this twisted and dark little flick come from someone buying a teddy bear at a garage sale and having it infested with bed bugs, then taking it home and passing on those bed bugs to your own place. This is one of those movies that's going to get under your skin and make you itch long after the credits. The stakes are relatively low, as it focuses on the destruction of a single family, but The Nest is a fun little film that tells its story well and knows how to make an impact utilizing all kinds of buggy horrors and gore. The Nest doesn't necessarily break new ground, but it does tell a tale that's pretty much projected from the beginning and handles all of the beats wonderfully and wickedly. I'm actually kind of surprised at the chances The Nest took. It doesn't hold back on the gore or the shocks. I was also impressed at the effects, which are pretty gross and aplenty. I don't know if a real bug was used in making this film, or maybe the CGI is just that good, but once the critter does emerge from the teddy bear, from its wiggly feelers to its erratically moving legs, it looks damn real, and something I would squish with a rolled up paper immediately. Much of Beth's inner turmoil and worry about her daughter's well-being and her marriage is depicted through her dreams. While some of these dreams are effective, I feel that film goes to this well a few times too many. Other than that, I had a blast with The Nest. It's a lo-fi, tiny creature feature using convincing pod person elements and a whole lot of slime and gore. From its potent ending to all of the warped stuff that came before it, The Nest can be nestled in between other effective doll horror films like Caveat, Willy's Wonderland, Benny Loves You, and the Chucky series that's coming up this fall. It looks like 2021 is the year of creepy dolls and monstrous stuffed animals. The Nest is just another movie that proves that. That'll be it for today. Please chime in down below in the comments and let me know how on the nose or mind-numbingly wrong I am, or you can counter with your own review. So guys, you know how YouTube works. I'd love to be able to dedicate more time to this channel. I'm not monetized yet, so if you want to help me out, remember to hit all the pertinent bells and whistles down below. Want some spooky comics to read? I have two new horror comic book trade paperbacks you should look out for. Both Grave Trancers and Pirouette, collecting never-before-published issues, can be found in only the finest of comic book shops. If you're looking for written reviews, you can find them on my website, mlmillerwrites.com. If you really want to show your support, I also have a Patreon page, at mlmiller. Look for the link to my Patreon page down below. Thank you so much for your time. And take care. Yeah.